We took a couple weeks off from Hebrews, uh, mostly because um, I wasn't here the last couple weeks. But then um, Jason, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, began Hebrews chapter 9, and he worked his way through the first 14 verses of the passage. And the emphasis of the first 14 verses of Hebrews 9 was that the blood of Jesus cleanses us so that now we can live lives of worship. Before, we weren't able to worship Jesus, but because of the blood of Jesus, we are now, who used to be enemies, are now priests offering worship to God. Our lives have been radically transformed because Jesus' blood was shed for us. Our relationship with God is different because of Christ and because we have a new covenant. And the remaining text in Hebrews 9 from verses 15 through the end of the passage gives us more information about the covenant and the role that Jesus plays in our lives. Look at me at verse 15 of Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9 verse 15. This verse gives us a summary of what the rest of the passage is about. Let me read it. Therefore... He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. There are three things that verse 15 says to us that the rest of the chapter is going to illustrate for us. The first is that Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant, that Jesus Christ stands between God and us, and because he is in the middle, we have access to God. If Jesus wasn't there, God would only see our sins, and we would be rejected. But because Jesus stands in between, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins and our transgressions, but he sees Jesus, and he accepts us on the basis of Jesus. He is the one that is working the relationship out between me and you and God. If Jesus wasn't there, there would be no me and God or you or God. We would be separated, isolated, rejected because of our sins. The second thing this verse is emphasizing is that the only way the covenant can be valid is through a death, namely the death of Jesus. Jesus is uniquely qualified to be a mediator of the new covenant on the basis of his own death. And the third thing, that the passage emphasizes, that verse emphasizes, is that Jesus' death provides the forgiveness or redemption for our sins. Jesus' death provides forgiveness, provides redemption for our sins. The word transgressions there in verse 15 is conveying a willful disobedience to God. It's not the idea that we unintentionally did a sin. It's the idea that our willful worst sins, Jesus is able to mediate between that God can forgive our worst willful disobedience to God because of him, because of Jesus. We have been forgiven, totally, completely forgiven because of Jesus. Listen, all of us have violated the first covenant. All of us have broken the law. There's not a person in this room that can say, we're perfect. We've messed up. Every one of us have broken it. We are sinners, but Jesus has made provision through his death for us. Look at verse 16 through verse 22. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who has made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins." Verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. In the first couple of verses there, verses 16 to 18, the altar is telling us that these covenants necessitate, necessitate a shedding of blood, that death had to happen in order for it to be enforced, in order for it to be active. In order for the covenant to be inaugurated, something had to die. 
It was the way God planned it to be. It's the way that he would manifest his glory. It's the way that he would display his love for us by sending his son to die for us. In the first covenant, in the Old Testament, there was death. There was a lot of death. There was constant animals dying. There was bloodshed. It required something to die. In the first covenant, Moses would take blood and he sprinkles it on everything because the law required it. Everything needed to be sprinkled with blood for purification and for consecration. The relationship for God did not happen if it wasn't purified and consecrated. So blood was spilt on everything. It was spilt on the people. It was spilt on the vessels and the items that were used in worship. It was spilt on everything and consecrated so that it was acceptable for God. The second reason that blood was spilled was because the verse 22 says it, that without blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness does not happen unless something or someone dies. See, under the first covenant, the forgiveness that was given to the people was a ritual cleansing. It was just a washing of the outside. It dealt with what they did, but the first covenant never dealt with the heart. It never dealt with what was going on inside of us. It could deal with, yeah, I've committed adultery, forgive my adultery, but it never addressed the root issue of it was my heart that was causing me to commit adultery. The first covenant would wash us from the acts that we've committed, but the second covenant, but it wasn't enough because that's why we'd have to constantly do these offerings over and over, year after year, because it never dealt with our hearts being changed. It never dealt with our lives being completely transformed that we wouldn't want to do sin anymore. It wasn't enough. Something more was needed. And beginning in verses 23 down, the author shows us that something better comes. Look at me, look at me at verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood on his own, not of his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about the day of atonement, the one day of the year where the high priest would go into the holy of holies and make sacrifice for the people. What would happen was the high priest would come into the outer courts of the tabernacle. The people were there. All the people were watching. The high priest would show up. The priest would be around him assisting him. They would bring the animals and in front of the people they would sacrifice the animal. And then the high priest would take the blood of the animal and only him and him alone would go into the Holy of Holies. No one else was allowed to go in there. He would go in. The people were standing on the outside watching the high priest go in. And they waited. And the high priest would take the blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. If the high priest came out, The very fact that he would come out was indication that God had accepted the sacrifices of the people. There were times when God did not accept the sacrifice of the people, and the high priest would actually die in the Holy of Holies. But the very fact that he walked out of the Holy of Holies back to where the people were was an indication that redemption is done. Your sacrifice has been accepted. Your sins have been forgiven. Can you imagine the anticipation on the faces of the people in the outer courts, watching the high priest go in with blood, not knowing if he's going to come back, not knowing if God is going to accept their sacrifices, 
not knowing what the future held, waiting anxiously to see if he'll come back. And can you imagine the joy on their faces when they see the curtains being moved and the high priest walking out and saying, forgiveness has been accomplished. Your sins have been forgiven. That's what the Old Testament was like, that the people had to live wondering if God would forgive them. Think about this. Jesus shows up in the midst of the people. He lives among them. He walks with them. He talks with them. He appears before the people. The Bible says in the fullness of time, he comes. And he gives a sacrifice in their midst. But it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats. It was his own blood. He gives his own life. Then he goes into the Holy of Holies, not the one constructed by human hands, but the one true Holy of Holies, the heavenly Holy of Holies. He enters into the presence of God, and according to this passage here, he is appearing in the Holy of Holies for us before God. Right now, by way of his blood, which has been sprinkled on the mercy seat, he is making atonement for our sins. He is interceding on our behalf. He is going to God the Father and saying, forgive them on the basis of my blood. Accept them on the basis of my sacrifice. And the passage clearly makes it clear that Jesus entered into it with finality. Notice the illustration here in the text. Every single one of us will die once. That's it. One life, one death. And with death, it's final. After death, there's judgment, but it's final. The illustration of finality is given so that we will understand that when Jesus died, that his death was for once and for all. He didn't need to do it over and over and over. He didn't need to keep coming back every time we've messed up. When he died, it was once and for all, for all of our sins that we've ever committed. There's no more year after year offering. There's no more year after year blood being shed. Jesus Christ was once and for all complete, total sacrifice for all of our sins. So that now he is constantly appearing before the Father on the basis of his blood so that the relationship we have with God is as if Jesus, as it's as if the same relationship that Jesus has with God. So that now, in Christ, you are as right with God as Jesus is right with God. Let that sink in for a moment. Right now, if you are a child of God, when God looks at you, he sees you the same way he sees Jesus. Son, daughter. He doesn't see you by your past. He doesn't see you by your struggles today. He doesn't see you by your screw-ups or your failures. He sees you as he sees Jesus. You're not identified by what you used to do. You're not identified by how you've messed up. You are recognized as son and daughter of God. Jesus right now is constantly appearing before God the Father on the basis of his blood, mediating a relationship between you and God so that right now, through faith in Christ, you are as right with God as Jesus is right with God. Once and for all, completely taken care of, our sins are paid for. So now do you know what we get to do? See, we now stand in the outer courts of this life. Jesus has gone into the Holy of Holies. And we're waiting eagerly for the high priest to come back. And when he does, what he will declare is redemption is final. Your sins have been forgiven. Come and live with me in paradise forever and ever. The text tells us that we are to eagerly wait. 
eagerly wait. See, Jesus has made provision for our forgiveness. And the ones who experience this great forgiveness that makes you right with God, you get to wait for him to come back. But here's the deal. It only applies to those who wait for Jesus. If you're not waiting for Jesus to come back, then forgiveness doesn't apply to you. This is a term that's used to convey what it looks like to have faith in Christ. Having faith in Christ means that you are eagerly waiting for him to return. You're eagerly waiting for him to come out of the Holy of Holies and say, listen, your redemption is final. I'm ready to take you into perfection. If you are waiting for me, I am ready to tell you it is done. I paid for it. You are completely forgiven. I have been interceding for you. I have been mediating this relationship for you. And now I come to take you home. Let me ask you, have you been waiting for the Lord? Do you live your life, day in and day out, eagerly anticipating Jesus returning. If we're honest, if I'm honest, can I say that is a challenge for us? That's a huge challenge for us. I think about the contrast between living life eagerly anticipating Jesus' return and a life that says, you know, I kind of prefer Jesus to come back another day a little later because I have some stuff I want to do. There's a huge contrast. What is it that causes me to prefer to say, Jesus, I wish you would delay your return? As a believer, one who has placed his faith in Jesus, what is it that causes me to not eagerly await his return, but to prefer his return to be delayed? I think there are two things that causes that, and both of those things need to be remedied in our lives. The first is I don't think we really understand what it means when we say that Jesus is going to return and declare that redemption is final. There's a lot of you in this room who are college students. You're working your butts off to get good grades and graduate. That is your goal, to finish school and graduate. There are a few of you that are super close to graduation date, and that's exciting when you think about it, right? It's, you're almost there. It's exciting for you. It's exciting for us because that means in a little while you'll get a job. You'll be working hopefully here in Dallas and there's some tithe money that's coming in and we can start doing some stuff around here. So it's exciting both for you and for us. See, I'd be concerned though if you weren't excited about graduating. If you came to me one day and you said, you know what, I'd prefer to stay in college for the rest of my life. I'd prefer to keep taking loans out and living in a dorm and eating cafeteria food for several more years. I really like writing term papers and being broke all the time. I don't want to grow up and graduate and get a job. I would look at you and say, are you insane? Do you realize that what's past college is so much better than what you're experiencing right now in college? For example, there is this thing called a job that you get after graduating. And when you get a job, they actually pay you to sit in the room and do stuff instead of you paying them to sit in the room and learning. It is so much better on this side of the circle. The money they give you, you can use it to go on trips. You can buy nice food. You can get new clothes. You don't have to borrow money from your parents anymore. You can get a nice car instead of the car that's being held together by duct tape that you're driving right now. Life after college, while it has its challenges, is so much better than what you're experiencing in college right now. In fact, when you get there, you'll realize that what you thought you had is so much superior to what you actually have right now when you're enjoying the benefits of graduating and a job. So much so that you don't miss what you used to have. You don't miss the broken down car. You don't miss the cafeteria food. You don't miss dorm life because life is better past that date. Listen, that's what it's gonna be like when Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, it's not the end of everything that we enjoy in this life. It's actually the beginning of everything we love in this life without the brokenness of sin. Think about the relationships that we're in. 
Every relationship is tarnished by sin. The people that are closest to us hurt us. In fact, we hurt the people that are closest to us. When Christ returns, those relationships don't end. Those relationships now begin without the brokenness of sin to mess it up. See, in Christ, the relationships that we have in eternity don't have the constraints and the bondage of sin. They are experienced in perfection. The life that you live right now, if you enjoy the things that you do and your work and your purpose and your God-given calling on your life, all of that is tainted by the brokenness of sin. And when Jesus returns, your God-given purpose will be experienced without the brokenness of sin. The things that you love in this creation The experience of this creation is broken by sin. But when Jesus returns and declares our redemption is final, he is going to recreate everything and create a brand new earth for us to live in, and it's going to be perfect. And we're going to enjoy the beauty and the splendor of his creation without sin, without failure, without disappointments, because it's going to be perfect. Everything that we think is so good in this life is nothing compared to what we're going to experience when Jesus returns. When, we're going to get, when we get to heaven, we're going to be in the presence of Christ where redemption is final and there is not one thing in this life that we will regret leaving behind. There's not one thing about this life that we will miss. Everything about eternity will be so perfect that we'll never want to go back to the way things used to be. It'll be wonderful. See, when we really understand what it means that Christ is returning for us and declaring that atonement is complete, redemption is final, (coughs) excuse me, if we get that, then we begin to eagerly wait. Listen, there's only one other reason why we aren't eagerly awaiting the return of our Savior. And that needs to be remedied as well. My wife's in kids' church, so don't tell her I said these stories. It's always her fault. But throughout the years, we have successfully misplaced our kids in places where they shouldn't have been misplaced. It's her, not me. Um, There was a time when I thought she was picking up the kids from daycare. She thought I was picking up the kids from daycare. We both get home and neither one of us have the kids. I am rushing back to daycare. It's already been closed for 10 minutes and our kids are sitting there wondering why their parents had forgotten about them. Um, That was one time. There's another time, Micah, our baby, has been lucky. He hasn't, he's not big enough to get lost yet. Um, He'll experience it. He's, uh, there's one time a couple years ago where a bunch of us, I think some of you were in there, we went to the Greek food festival that was at this Greek Orthodox church down the street, and there was thousands of thousands of people there. Uh, there was Greek music and Greek culture and food, and there's about 10, 15 of us, and Tim was about two. I thought Ann had her. She thought I had him. Um, and we were standing there, and we look at each other, and neither one of us have him. We went into panic mode. She starts screaming. She starts freaking out. I'm just trying to figure out where the heck is my son. Where I gathered all the people that were with us. We basically literally shut that church down for five minutes. For five minutes, we ran into the lobby, looked under every seat, looked everywhere we could look for. Five minutes later, we actually find him sitting on the stage just like a pastor's kid, just sitting there bored out of his mind. But for five minutes, we thought our life was coming to an end. You know, if you've experience something like that, when something like that happens, the first inclination is that, man, we are sucking at this parent business. We've got to make this up for our kids. So the, the time we left them at daycare and they were wondering why we forgot about them, I took them to McDonald's and bought them a Happy Meal and all was quickly forgiven and forgotten and they, they were good with it. This is the inclination that you want to make up to them when you do something wrong and you mess up. That's what you naturally do. You ever been in an experience where you did something wrong and your initial response is, I've got to make this up. I've got to fix this. I've got to make this right. I mean, if you're married, come on. 
mean, that's basically our entire married life, right? We're constantly fixing our mistakes. We're constantly like, screwed up. I've got to get this right. I've got to make sure she's not angry with me anymore. That's our lives. That's all you do in marriage. It's either trying to fix the mistakes that your wife made or pointing out the mistakes that she made so that she could fix it and make it up. These are the stuff that happens in marriage, in relationships. You fail, you realize that you need to make up for that failure. We're like that. That's our human nature. But listen, God isn't like that. He's not that way. I've got a friend who was in seminary with me who spent most of his life living in sin, destroyed his life, um, finally encountered the grace of God, and his comment to me was, I've got to spend the rest of my life living for God so that I can make up for the wrongs that I did when I was younger. You ever feel like that? That you needed to make up for the mistakes that you made before God? Have you ever struggled with the feeling that you aren't good enough? that you needed somehow to balance the scales or even the score by doing more good so that the good you do either comes close to the bad that you've done or hopefully outweighs the bad that you've done so that you can demonstrate to God that you are better today than you were last year this time or last month this time or even yesterday? Have you ever felt like you needed to do that? Let me ask it to you this way. When do you feel like you are the closest to God? When do you feel that you are right with Jesus? When do you feel that the most? Is it when you are furthest away from your biggest failure? Is that when you feel the best about your spiritual life? I mean, we're all like that. We're all like that. The furthest away I get from my biggest failure, the better I feel about my relationship with God. Guess what? That's not how it works. That's not how it works. I don't need to even the score. I don't have to balance the scale. I don't have to make up for my sins. Because I cannot improve on what Jesus did when he shed his blood for me. I, there's nothing I can do to outdo what he already did on my behalf. See, when Jesus died and shed his blood and I placed my faith in him, all of my sins were forgiven once and for all, paid for. There is no other payment necessary, totally forgiven. If you don't get that, do you know what you're going to keep doing? You're going to keep ending up living your life trying to delay the return of Christ because you feel like you just aren't good enough yet. You will never do anything for Jesus because you feel like you're not good enough yet. Listen, none of us are good enough. We weren't saved because we were good enough. Listen, God is not waiting for you to get things right because before he is good with you. God took care of that through the mediation of Jesus when he shed his blood for my sins and your sins. You don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it all. And he is appearing right now for you in the holy of holies, making atonement for your sins so that all of your sins are forgiven, done, complete. There is no more sin in the eyes of God when he looks at you. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see someone whose life has been scarred. But he sees someone who's been forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. No matter how far it's been since your last mess up. Or if your big mess up was just last night. Through faith in Jesus... His blood takes care of your sin, and there is nothing you can do to improve on that. So now, you are free to eagerly wait the return of Jesus. There's an incredible difference between living under the motivation 
that you have to do something to get approved by God and living under the motivation that Christ has done it all for me. There is nothing I can do to repay him other than live my life in worship before him. Let me encourage you this morning, if you are struggling with trusting that Jesus paid it all for you, let me encourage you to start praying and reminding yourself this very simple prayer. And do it often. Do it every time you feel like you can't make it or you're not good enough. Pray, God, I am so glad that the blood of Jesus is sufficient for my sin, for cleansing my sin, and that you don't remember it anymore. And my relationship with you is radically transformed because of Jesus. And remind yourself of that daily. His blood is sufficient. I believe in the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus. There is nothing I can do. There is nothing I have to do today to try to convince God to forgive me. He has chosen to do it, and the evidence of that is the new covenant in Jesus. I am glad that his blood is sufficient for my sin because there is not enough that I can do to make up for the sins that I have done. So I don't want to live my life as if I'm trying to make up for my failures and my sins and my past. I want to live in awe of the Savior who died for me and redeemed me despite of my failures. And I want to live my life in worship and say, God, my life now is for you because you have radically transformed me. So I live in worship of you. I want to enjoy that. Do you know what's going to happen to you when you begin to enjoy this and when you begin to enjoy the forgiveness that God has given you? Here's what's going to happen. You're going to begin to pursue God. You're going to pursue godliness. Why? And you're going to do it for two reasons. Number one, you're going to pursue godliness and you, because you want to glorify the one who forgave you at no expense of your own, but at a tremendous price of his own. You want to glorify him. And the second is you're going to recognize that the greatest way to enjoy the new covenant is in the pursuit of God. Let me close. When you understand, really understand what God has done in your life, it would radically transform how you live this life. You don't no longer need to earn acceptance. You don't need to prove yourself to other people. You don't need to prove yourself to God. You are free from your sins. You're free from regret. You are free from the bondage of sin because you have been forgiven not on the basis of what you did, but on the basis of the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood is vital for our faith. You are absolutely forgiven. Totally. This is the message of the gospel. This morning as we come to the communion table, we come recognizing that blood was spilled for the sins that we committed And God looks on the blood and it says, I accept it. Forgiveness is given. Atonement has been made for. You are no longer condemned. You have been set free. This message of the blood has to transform how we live our lives. Otherwise, we will live our lives constantly thinking we have to prove ourselves to people and God when God says you have already been accepted because of Jesus. And when it sinks into your life, it changes everything about you.
as you come to the table this morning, let me invite you to examine your heart, your actions, your attitudes, your affections from this past week. See if there's anything in your life that's not from Jesus. And don't come this morning feeling condemnation. But let me invite you to run to the foot of Jesus who freely offers you grace and forgiveness. He's ready to accept you. Maybe this morning you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, you know about him. Yeah, you go to church. Yeah, you do your religious duty. Maybe you're trying to earn your way to heaven by doing good things. But this morning, the gospel is speaking to you and challenging you and saying, you don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to show God how good you are. If you put your faith in Jesus, he will accept you on the basis of Jesus. Not on what you do. The way we do communion here, the worship team will start singing here in a few moments. The elements are ready at the table. After you have examined your heart, if there's things that you need to repent of, you can repent of them. And when you are ready, you're welcome to come to the table grab the elements and come back to your seat and Beno will lead us in communion time. We'll partake of the elements together. This table that we celebrate week in and week out, we do it because it reminds us that this is not about us. It's about Jesus. So come to the table recognizing the great price that he paid and come in all of him. Father, this morning, I pray that if there are things in our lives that need to be repented of, that your spirit would show us and we quickly repent. God, if we are living our lives as if we don't want you to come back because we're enjoying this life so much more, I pray that your spirit will convict us, show us that life with you is so much better. Father, if we're trying to earn our way, would you convict us? Would you point us back to Jesus and the work that he's done? Thank you for saving us. We love you. In Jesus' name.